Welcome to the Oracle of Light. I am your host, Shauna DeMellon, and I have the beautiful Emily Graham here with me today. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm very excited. Very excited. Would you would you share with our listeners everything about Emily? What would you like to share? Uh, tell us who you are and 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 your journey that brought you to where you are today. That's a big question. <laughs> so I am a mom. Um, I am a wife. Um, we live in the Orlando area. I, I guess I'll just go right for it. So I'm a mom of three. Um, my oldest son, Cameron, um, he died at the age of seven. And he literally, we are in our eighth year. We're working through our eighth year right now, which blows my mind. So he was here actually has been gone longer than he's been here, which is surreal. Yes. So I still have two girls here that I'm raising. My daughters right now are 11 um, and seven. And so we are kind of doing the whole mom thing, but for a long time, we really struggled with that. Um, so my son went from, I always say healthy to gone in a matter of 12 hours. Um, he was sort of your normal, healthy mama's boy, full of life. And literally went to bed Christmas Eve, if you can believe it, um, perfectly fine. Um, we had a little bit of a cold stuff we were dealing with, but he was perfectly fine. And in a few hours he woke up and he was not fine. So we escalated very quickly um, by like two in the morning, Christmas morning, we were loading him in the car. I was taking him to the ER. We had this big medical mystery, had no idea what was going on. And he ended up, I don't know, between five and six in the morning, went into a coma that he never awoke from. Mm -hmm. We were transferred to Children's Hospital. On that, um, on that transition over there, things got worse. And he ended up, his brain hemorrhaged um, over several hours. His organs started shutting down and they really had no idea what was going on. And so we ended Christmas day, which was also my birthday, um, mm -hmm. removing life support. And so completely changed everything, turned our world upside down. And so, as I said, that whole, I mean, we spent years, I always tell people child loss is one of those things that it takes years to figure out and understand and adjust. And I, I don't know, reconnect, even, even think about reconnecting with life. And so we did all of that. And through that process, um, I've reconnected with Cameron. I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people, but I reconnected to Cameron in this new way. And we, I, fe I feel like he is my greatest teacher. He taught me unconditional love. He made me a mom, all of that. And now he is still teaching me. And so he and I, I say, do the work that I do together. I'm a grief and life coach now. I work specifically with other bereaved parents, sort of talking about how we navigate child loss and how we figure out who we are now and how we maintain that bond with our kids and how we figure out how to do life again. Mm, beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Thank you. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love I love that you have created such a beautiful community and it's just this beautiful, all-inclusive community for everyone to come together, uh, anyone who has lost a child. And, and it, I love what you said. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, you know, we become just different parts of us. We just become like this completely yeah. different person. It's just, it's like life that we knew it, it doesn't exist like that anymore. And so it's just, it's sort of recalibrating that. And it's just, it's really finding it finding our place in the world again amidst this loss. Now there was something that you had you had written about. Um it was making friends with our grief. Would you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so that was something that came through my journey. Um somebody when you're in sort of that self-healing spiritual kind of journey, a lot of people talk about the concept of like making friends with things. And it really sort of hit me in a way that was perspective shifting or really helpful to me. And the way that I look at it is when I was in early grief specifically, um, I guess just the way that you feel when you're there and you are in this state of just complete shutdown, you are pushing back against your reality. You do not want to be there. You can't do anything. You don't want to do anything, right? So you're creating a lot of resistance in your life. And that resistance takes a lot of energy to kind of hold that up and maintain that 
And what I found was I was creating a lot of extra struggle for myself in that space. And so when somebody explained this concept of befriending grief, the way that they explained it was this story that they kind of shared. And I always loved this story. So they basically talk about it as being like, let's say you have a party at your house. And you have this friend that comes over. It's not really a close friend. It's not somebody that you like really well. They're kind of annoying. They're kind of hard to be around, but they're going to show up and they're going to be at this party. You really don't want them there, but you know that it's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of drama, a lot of stress to sort of push them out and force them out. And even if you do, they're just going to come back. Mm -hmm. And so instead of right? A lot like doing all of that drama, all of that stress, you've got to find this new way to sort of engage with that friend. And so instead, it's more like you invite them in and you make space for them and you sort of like, it's, it's a different feel, right? When you can sort of invite them in and make friends with them. And so in this analogy, right, you are basically the house and this friend is your grief. And it's like, they're going to come in, they're going to be here. This is our new reality we can't force them away, even though we try and try and try. Yes. If we just let it come in, it's almost like, you know, when your friend shows up at your house and you're like, Hey, come on in, let's sit down, let's have a drink, let's chat. I found that when I could start to do that with my grief and I would feel the waves coming and I would be like, okay, I am in a funk right now. All I need to do is just shut down the rest of my life and just be like, okay, here we are. Let's do this. Let's do nothing if we need to, but just be with it, make friends with it. And I find that it moves through me much faster than what it ever did before. So that's kind of what I think about, right? When it's making mm -hmm. friends with our grief and it's literally inviting it in and saying, hey, you're going to be here probably for the rest of my life. So let's figure out how to do this. I love that. I love that. And, and our common connection is that we've, we've lost children. And so, you know, and I've shared this before, you know, when I, when I lost Jack, it, it literally spun me into this, this fog. It was almost like I was in this fog for like two or three years. And it was just like, I would just, I would distract myself with anything. So I didn't even have to yes. think about it. It was like, how many cupcakes do you need? Can I volunteer this year? Can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? <laughs> it was just, I was just catapulting myself into anything I could find to, to not even look at it. You know, how much laundry yeah. can I do today? Did I clean this? Did I do this? And it was this continual. And and what you were saying, you know, I mean, creating that kind of struggle for myself and that resistance, I was exhausted. Yes. I would fall into bed at night and I would have this fitful sleep and get up in the morning and go, I would hear, yeah, I would just sort of feel it sort of bubble to the surface. And I think, nope, we're going to go do this. Here we go again. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 we're not doing that. And it was almost like, it was like, I, I told people, you know, it was like Groundhog Day. And, yes. and it was just like, uh, okay. And it wasn't until I reconnected with Jack. It wasn't until I had that, had that reconnection with him and I knew that he was okay. And, and I had that experience that I was, I was finally able to let the grief in, as you said, yes. I was finally able to okay, I, I can't keep pushing this aside. Mm. Yeah, it's exhausting. It's mentally, physically, emotionally exhausting when you are in that deep grief space. And I 100% agree. Once I validate it, I think my biggest question throughout those first few years is where did Cameron go? What's it like where he is? How do I figure that out? Does he still exist, right? So it blows yes. up your entire belief system. And so you're kind of putting that puzzle back together. And I feel like when I put that puzzle back together, then I was like, okay, so he's still here. We're still connected. Now I can look at this grief experience and figure out what do I need to do to heal what I can in this yes. so that I can do this. Like it's, yeah, it was this mm. process. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and it was funny because people would say to me, well, you're a medium, just connect with him. And he was literally gone. It was just like, what, what just happened? Where did he go? Oh yeah. my God. And, and yeah, you're right. Like it shook everything, all of my beliefs and, and everything, all the faith I had and, and all the work that I did up until that point, it was just like, yeah. does it even mean anything? Is it real? Where did he go? Yes. What happened? What have I believed in this whole time? What if it's all, what if it all doesn't, doesn't oh, yes. add up anymore? Yeah. It was just like the core of my being was just rattled and I, I didn't even know what to do with it. And so, yeah, I just, I tried to run away from it. And it was interesting because then 
when I started to work through everything, I realized I was in shock and I was in disbelief and, and, you know, and, and I started to delve into, um, you know, the different stages of grief and, and what I've realized, and I, I'd love your perspective on this as well is what I've realized is that there's, there's no cookie cutter. Here's a book. This right. is what you're going to experience. These are the stages. This is what it's going to look like. This is how you're going to feel. It's just, it's no, it is so it's individual and it just, it, this is our heart. I mean, when you lose a child, that is your heart. And so it's like, there is no book on the planet that can describe that. So I, I'd love your, your perspective on that. I completely agree. I tell people all the time in my community, I'm like, I wish I could just give you a checklist and say, do this, 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 and this will all fix it for you. Yeah. Like we can't fix this. It is so individual and unique. And I think it's important for us all to share our stories and to be open and honest about what we're going through, because that's where the connection comes from. And it's like, oh, you feel that too? Okay, that's what this is, right? It helps us put words to what we're feeling. It helps us normalize it. And then we can sort of say, okay, so that's what this is. So now here's what I can do to help myself through this. Yes. So we need that collective community, I think, of support. I 100% agree. You know, 10 years ago, I mean, Jack would have been 10 this year. And so 10 years ago, it was like no one, I didn't know where to go or who to talk to or, and you know, and all of our friends, um, you know, they hadn't started their families yet. And yeah. so it was just kind of like, what do I do with this? Yeah. It just, it was like, it was like this version of me, um, just didn't exist anymore. And so it was just this whole identity crisis and it was working through the grief and everything. And it just, it really, I can look back now and I can go, Oh, Oh, <laughs> that's what right. that was it's like new perspective. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's so true. And it's, it's, you know, and, and I tell people that's, that's why I do the work that I do now is, is because of Jack and, and I don't want anyone to feel alone with that. I want to give everyone a space to share, share and talk about it and honor our children and, and the experience. And, you know, I always tell people, I just have a different relationship with Jack now. He isn't yes. here in the physical, but he's 100% alive in spirit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if you believe in that, not everybody believes in that. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of people come at me over the years about, about what I do and, and that's not real. And how do you know? And, you know, I always tell people, well, you know, how do you know that you're breathing? How do you know that you're breathing? And you know what, we're, what works for me works for me. And, and I honor your journey, what works for you. And, right. and, and like you said, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, and it's, it's almost like, I don't know if you've experienced this. I've had a, I've had several people come at me over the years, like, oh, well, just stop talking about it. You know, just, just get over it. And, and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you, you should have done this and, and you could have done that. And, and da, 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 da. And I had, uh, I had a, a medium, a psychic say to me, well, you know, you could have adopted or you could have done this, or you could have done that. And it was just, there's almost like there's this, this shame around talking about child loss. And it's, it's just, it's like, you didn't do enough or you didn't do the right stuff or you shouldn't talk about it, or it's just, it's not real. Or it just, oh my goodness. Have you experienced any of that? Yes. I would say a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of what I've experienced is because we I've shared our story so publicly. Mm -hmm. And so you get the people, I feel like the people that do that level of judgment are people that they don't know you. They're on the other side of a screen right? I've had people, I got people questioned um, what we did that day. I had people shame us for leaving the hospital to go home and tell our daughter on Christmas day that all these people were coming into town because her brother was not going to survive, right? Like all of these crazy things. I've had people come back and, you know, shame me for the way that I grieved or for something that I wrote and being like, you know, you need to do this or you're doing this wrong or you need to be committed, right? All of these crazy things. And I really think, like you said, every journey is individual. I believe in transparency and sharing that stuff mm -hmm. because it's in those darkest moments that people feel so alone. And if you hear somebody else say something, then you get this glimmer of hope, right? That, well, maybe this is just a moment and I can get through this because they did, right? Or there's somebody else that feels this, and I just think the more that we talk about it, the better we are. And again, we are, I never ask anybody to rebuild their belief system or do exactly what I've done, right? Use mine as a model. You take what resonates with you and you try it. If it works for you, fantastic. If it doesn't, keep looking. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we all will have a different belief system, a different whatever, and that's okay. You figure out what resonates with you and what works for you. 
Yes. I love that. And I always tell people the same thing. I say, you know what, take what resonates and leave the rest. Yeah. I'm not here to tell you, you have to do it my way or my way is the only way to do it. It's just, it's a different perspective, a different take on it. And, yeah. and, you know, it's, it's very much along the, the, the lines of the work that you do. It's, you know, I don't want people to feel alone. I want them to feel yes. like they have a safe place to land. I mean, this is, this is our heart, you know, and I remember uh, my daughter, Emma, uh, she will be 18 this year. Um, I remember she uh, came home from, from school one day and I just finished up a client day and she said, mom, why do you always have Kleenex on the table? I said, well, sweetheart, you know, we're, we're, we're holding, we're, we're holding sacred space. We're holding someone's heart and their loss and their grief wow. and all of their hurt. And so, the tears are going to fall and the tears will, will help. And the tears will just, you know, help them maybe to release things and, and, and just really honor what they're experiencing. And so it's, yeah. um, I'm, I'm sure that you, you experience that as well. I mean, I just, everyone that I work with cries and it's just, yes. it's, it's, if I have, if I have a session or I teach a class where someone doesn't cry, I think what happened? What's, what's going on? Right. What's what, <laughs> yeah. And we everyone, I was going to say, I, I host weekly small groups with parents. And when new people come in and we tell our stories, even in normal weeks, you might have a hard week. And as you're retelling something, you start to cry. And everybody's always like, I'm sorry. And we have a rule in all my groups. Everybody will be like, no, we don't apologize here. Because you have to have that release and you have to share that and make space for that. You do. And I always tell people it's messy. Life yeah. is messy. Yes. grief has its own category of messy. It yes. has its own, its own book, its own, its own, its own, um, you know, series, if you will. And it's just, it's, you know, and, and we talked a little bit about this the other day, you know, how, you know, it's so important to um, have the right people in your world, you know, the people that have earned the right to hear your story. Right. And, you know, after I lost Jack, I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't, you know, I was angry at, you know, we had, you know, had sort of the in vitro process and things just didn't go according to plan. And so I just, I didn't even know, didn't even know how to attack that or what to do with it or who to talk to. And, and then yeah. I found that relationships shifted because of it, because a lot of people were like, you know, it wasn't real. It, it, it just so would be thankful that you have your daughter, you know, it just, you know, and just some of the things that people would say over the years. Now I kind of look back and I think, <laughs> where did that come from? Like, why would yeah. you say that? Right. And so it's, um, I, and I love what you say, you know, like it's, it's, there's no apology required. It's just, it's, yeah. And everyone, everyone grieves differently. Everyone handles it differently. And, you know, I'm sure that you do this as well. You know, when I'm working with people, I, I like to tune in. I just like to have a look at their heart and just kind of yeah. have a look at their energy and see where they're sitting and what that looks like. And I find, I don't know if you find this, I find some people, they just get stuck. They get yeah. stuck and, and it's just like, and almost like they want to, mm, it's almost like they want to wear the loss as a badge of suffering. It's like, they just, they can't possibly imagine building a new life, building right. something beautiful again. Yeah. I think that is very true. Um, I think that we, people don't like it when I use the word choice in grief, but mm -hmm. I, it took me a long time to see choice. Yeah. And I do think that we choose some of the things, you know, the ways that we respond, the ways that we move forward, the things that we are doing. Yes. I think to the language that we use in grief, when you come into any grief community, especially in child loss, you are constantly bombarded with people telling you it never gets easier. You're going to grieve forever. You're going to do right. And they have, there's this laundry list of things yeah. and you do create this belief in your system that, oh, so this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life. And I think for a lot of people, like you latch onto that because you feel that connection in pain. We talk about this a lot. Like when, when I was in that deepest part of grief, I felt most connected to Cameron at that time. And it took me a long time to realize that that connection can exist over here just as strong. And so I have to figure out how to untangle this. Yes. And I think for a lot of people making that transition is one that is never actually made or they really struggle to make. So it's true. Get stuck there. Mm -hmm. it, it's true. And, you know, I will say to people, you know, this, this doesn't negate the loss that you've experienced. Yeah. I said, yes. you know, I'll tell them suffering is a choice. Like we, yeah. can, we can choose to suffer. We can choose to stay in there. And, and, you know, I've, I've heard, as you have, I've heard such horrific, tragic stories of how 
of how parents have, have lost their children. And it's just, oh my goodness, I just, but that loss is, it's a loss and it's yours and it's, it's not going away. And yeah. I love what you said about, you know, making friends with it, you know, you got to figure out how to do this. Yeah. Yes. Lay down and die with them. I feel like one of our greatest ways to honor them is to figure out how to do this. And we do it with them. And I, that for me was such a big perspective shift. Like they are not gone. I hate that word gone. Mm -hmm. They're still here. They're here in a different way. And we have to figure out how to tap into that and use that. Yes. And, 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 you know, you'd mentioned this the other day about, you know, connecting into their essence, you know, Mm -hmm. the essence of who that is and, um, you know, yes, it's still there. And then we can still connect with it. And um, there have been probably you know, dozens of, of moms I've connected with over the years. And they've said, you know, well, I will, I'll be at peace when, when I'm with them, when I'm connected with them. And it's just, it it hurts my heart to hear that because yes, in those early days, I thought, I don't want to be here. I mean, I wasn't suicidal, but I was like, no, 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 no. He's supposed to be here. I I don't want to be here without him. I want to be where he is. This is, this is not how it's supposed to go. And so, yeah, I think a lot of it, you know, was just, no, not accepting it. Not at all. Like I wasn't able to reconcile wow. any of it for years. And then finally being able to get to a point where I had grieved him and I'd mourned and I'd, you know, I, I joke with people, you know, I didn't wear mascara for years because I didn't know when I was going to be triggered. Or right. what it was look like. It was just like, <laughs> oh, <it was> just, <laughs> you know, I'd just be, you know, taken over by this, wow. this, this tailspin, you know, it just, it was, it was crazy. Um, but you know, now, and I, not that I say to people, you know, let's like run the cell in our lining. Let's look for the positives. Let's, you know, we've gone through something traumatic and something yeah. that's changed us. And if I can help one person to not feel any of the despair that I felt to that degree, then, oh, amazing. Yes, it's a win. That's like, that's why we do this is that one person. And if it's more than one, awesome. But like, it's the one person. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. Tell us a little bit more about your group, your weekly group. What does that look like? Yeah. So I run a program called Living with Grief. It is designed for bereaved parents. Literally, we, I don't like the term grief support necessarily, because I feel like you have this idea in your head of what that means. And this is not that traditional program. Literally, it's people who I would say are on what I would call a healing journey. It's sort of that journey of we're going to figure this out. I can't be like this for the rest of my life. And so we need people, right? We need to raise ourselves out of those grief communities where people are choosing to sort of stay in that state of suffering, or they're at the early stage where they're not ready for the next thing. And so this is sort of the next thing. And so I do weekly lives in our Facebook group every week on a whole bunch of different topics. A lot of the kind of stuff that we're talking about today, like making friends with our grief and right? How do we figure out our emotions? How do we come back into our bodies and understand what we need? How do we build a self-care practice? How do we do all these things, Mm -hmm. right? So it just offers tools and discussion and things that are uplifting and helpful. Um, And then, so I sort of have two levels. I have the basic level. And then for people who want a little bit more support, we do the weekly small group discussions. So we have a topic every week and we get together in a Zoom room and we all share our weeks. And then we're like, hey, let's talk about this, right? So it gives us this constructive way to talk about, you know, what we're experiencing and what we can learn from it and, you know, how we integrate this with our life and figure out how to keep taking steps forward. Mm-hmm. I love that. And, and, and just for our listeners, we will have all of the information, how to find, how to find Emily and, and all of her beautiful offerings in the show notes. Um, you know, it's, it's, I love that, you know, and, and I've, I want to say about five years ago, I started to really delve into, okay, what kind of support is out there for parents? Like what, what's out there, you know, and I, I read books and I listened to podcasts and, and really started to delve into it. And I, I found some different groups and organizations and, and I just didn't find the right fit for me. And, yeah. you know, and, and that's okay, right? Like everyone finds who they need and what they need. And I believe right. when we're ready, the right person or the right, you know, yeah. opportunity will start to show up. It's like, when we're ready for it, it just, it's, it's, it's there in the universe. We'll, we'll have our back in that regard. And so it's, it's beautiful to, you know, to know that you are, are there and that you've created this beautiful, beautiful space. And not that this is a, 
uh, a group or a community that we would have ever have said, Hey, I want to be a part of that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> hey, you know what? I think that's so on in. This is so much fun. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. And you know, I say to people all the time, you know, there isn't anything that I wouldn't do to have Jack here in the physical. There just, there 100%. isn't. Yeah. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, I'm 10 years in. So those first few years were, were horrific. I was brought to my knees. I, I just didn't really know what to do or what end was up. And it was just, it was all consuming. So yes. if you have someone who comes to you and, and they're at that place where it just feels all consuming, is that, do, is there a space for them in what you offer? Yes. So there is space. I, I like to say that the things that I'm putting out there meet you where you are. I have people who are brand new, like weeks and months into their grief that will join the program. Um, I have people who have been with me for a really long time, people who are five to 10 years into their grief. Mm -hmm. And they're all in different phases of being ready for what comes next and looking for the right things. Some of them already feel like they were doing that. They just wanted more people to connect with and more opportunity to do it. So it's a huge spectrum. And I literally believe it kind of meets you where you are and it grows with you, right? Because it's that take what resonates, release what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said earlier about the universe sort of putting things in your path. That's how I think about it. I always will tell people when you're ready, you're going to know you're ready and you're going to see things kind of placed in your path. And you're going to say, okay, this is it. Let's take a chance to try this. And Yep. It's trial and error. Everything that we do in this life is practice. It's literally like, how do I want to show up? How do I want to do this? Now let's go out and practice it. Okay, what did I get wrong? How, what do I do next time? And that's that's how I tell people to approach re-entry to life after grief is like, we take it in little tiny baby steps and it's like mm -hmm. picturing, how do I want this to look or feel or be? Let me try that. And then what went wrong? And then it's just sort of a process of working through that. I love that re-entry into life that wow. we withdraw, right? We, we disconnect, mm -hmm. we go into ourselves, we isolate, mm -hmm. and then it's scary to go back out into the world. So we have to work through a lot of fear. We have to work through a lot of triggers. We have to work through all kinds of stuff just to be in life. And so oh, absolutely. Have some tiny little baby steps to just reconnect and re-enter life. Oh, I love that. I, that was beautifully, beautifully put. That was perfect. Um, you know, and it, I found that it just, it, it, after losing Jack, it just impacted everything. I mean, that was the beginning of the end of my marriage. It yeah. changed how I parented Emma. It changed how I showed up in the world. I felt like for those, you know, I look back now and it's like, I just had a, a happy mask on. Yes. <laughs> it's like, everything is fine. And then I would go to my room and shut the door and ball my eyes out yes. <laughs> and they'd be like, okay, this is fine. And I didn't, I didn't give it a chance to just go through me and do what it needed to do. And I think that is, that is one of the big, the big pieces that I love to give parents is that if you are able to just sit with it and be with it and just let it go through you, it will not destroy you. You're, yes. you're, you're, you're just, you're going to, I promise you that if you allow the process, allow it to be ugly, allow it to, oh my goodness, I used to drive we're in, in Calgary, uh, Alberta, we're in Canada. So we're, we're above Montana. If that gives people a reference point yeah. and about an hour outside the city is, is this beautiful natural reserve. It's, it's called elbow falls. And so I would literally once a week, I would grab a latte, hop in the car and I would drive out there and I would sit there and I would just cry and cry and cry and cry. And that's where I started to find heart rocks. And it was like, wow. then it slowly started to transition into, Oh, Jack, mama needs heart rocks. And then it was yeah. just like, get there. And it would be like, okay, maybe I would have a few tears and I would just sort of have a release. I've, there's something about releasing near fast moving bodies of water for me. I'm not sure what that okay. is, but I always tell people that is yeah. cleansing. And so I would go. And then pretty soon it was like, I think there was one day I was driving back into the city and I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't cry today. And I had this pile of heart rocks beside me. It was just like, Oh, okay. Okay. And it's, you know, it's, it's finding that, that community that can hold space for you, that community that understands. And it's, it's, again, it's, it's, you know, this isn't a group that we, we chose to come into. This is just, I we've think. made the best of it. And we've, we've figured out how to reintegrate into life. And, you know, I, I love to be able to share my experiences because perhaps it'll make it relatable for other people that yes. you can get through this and, and wow. you can come out the other side of it you know, yes. Are we more resilient? Yes. Do we have a greater capacity for love? Absolutely. Like it just, 
it's like it just allows us to show up as as the best versions of us and do the work that we do. Yes, I agree. And I totally relate to the becoming the best version of yourself. And I think that's another thing that people struggle with when you go through a loss like this. Like I didn't want my child to die for me to be the best version of myself. No. Like, well, I I, I don't know. I think we create meaning around our story. And we all do that in our own personal way. I never in a million years would have imagined that I would have believed that things played out the way that they were supposed to play out. But looking back now, that is my belief. It was not my belief early on. And so I do think that that's a really hard thing to grasp and to proceed from. And yeah, I would give it all up for him to be back here. This is the hand we've been dealt. And so why do I want to be in misery? No, I want to try to find a way to do this. I want to try to find my purpose, live my purpose, right? Give back, have something positive come. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. I listened to a podcast um, from Peter Crone and he had said, what did he say? He said, the past is the past. Everything happened the way that it was going to happen and we can't go back and change it. Yeah. And so if we can come to a point where we can, you know, accept that, okay, that's happened. Not to say that we like it or that it was, yes. it, it was, it was painless. Just, okay, that's, that's what's happened. Now, what do we do with this? One of the yeah. things that, that I found was um, I would go, you know, I would go for a walk every day down by the river and I would walk and I just kept thinking, I, I've got to figure this out. I can't live like this. Yes. I just felt like I was just this shell of myself walking around. And whenever there were other people around, I'd be like, oh, hi how is your day and oh yeah <laughs> like I, it's like I just I would show up but I really wasn't there I was just this vacant you know bleh. Yeah. life was just like I said like it was a groundhog day and I just kept thinking no there's got to be there's got to be something else I can do and then I was actually guided to have a reading with this beautiful soul and in the reading she had said you know well Shauna have you talked to Jack and I said no I can't see him I can't feel him I don't know where he went like I said I don't know what to believe in do I believe in God is there a God I said I'm so angry at the doctors at at everyone I said I just yeah. I'm so angry I said I just I don't even know what to do with this and she said well look up and I looked up and there was this beautiful angel walking into the room holding hands with a little boy who would have been three and I just started crying and he got closer and I realized it gets me emotional to this day. I'm like, I'm looking at myself. Oh my God. And it was, it was Jack. And so it was just in that moment, it was, it was like, everything was okay. Yeah. It was, it was okay. He's okay. I could see my other loved ones. I was like, okay, okay, okay. He's, he's okay. He's okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. He's okay. Oh, and it was for me, it was making that connection with him that allowed me to start to heal, that allowed yeah. me to start to go through it and work through it. And, and just, yeah. Do you get signs from Cameron? I do. Um, I, so I started getting signs really, really early and I didn't know that they were like, I didn't really know what to do with them. So within the first few weeks he was gone, I started seeing his shadow run through our house and I was like, I can't tell anybody this because I'm going to be committed. Like this doesn't happen. Right. I was super spiritual before, believed that this stuff happened, but it happened to other people. It did not happen to me. And then when this experience happened, it was like, holy crap, what is going on? Um, so that was going on early. I was also seeing the number 12 over and over and over again. And in my first medium reading, we did our first one. We were probably like two to three months after his death. And she turned and looked at me and she said, you've seen him. And she was like, and you've been seeing the same number over and over and over again. And I'm going, yeah. And my husband was like, no. And I was like, yes. And he's like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> so that was the 12s. During that time, I was literally like, is he there? Is this him? Like, it has to be him. And I'm like, is he going to use this number? And so then it became the 12s. I feel like there's almost like a working out that communication plan, yes. right? Across the veil where it's like, he's like, okay, she's seeing the 12s. Yep. You're getting it. I'm going to use the 12s. And now we figure it out. Yeah. So 12 is his, is, is the number. I don't know why. And, um, hearts, you talked about heart rocks for, for us, we will just get hearts in different places too. So those are the two biggest ones, um, that we will get all the time. And I tell people all the time, it took me a long time to see 
They show up in the moments that we are trying to live again, that we are engaged in life, that we are reconnecting in a way that Mm -hmm. he is like, yes, I'm here, right? I'm showing up. I'm still here. And when you can make that shift and find them in those moments, it becomes easier to make that transition. Oh, I love that. That was beautifully, beautifully put. I just, I love that, you know, and I, I call, I call the the signs, I call them sprinkles from heaven. It's like, they're just little sprinkles from heaven. Like they're, they're with us and they're, they're even more excited that we get it. Yeah, <laughs> They're just like, oh, they got it. They got it. Keep, keep sending them, keep sending them. And it's just, I think it's just, it's, it's so beautiful. And, um, and I always tell people, you know, again, and from my own experience, you know, as a medium and, you know, I've, I've connected with the other side for my whole life. And so to not have that connection with him was just so debilitating. It was just, it was just heartbreaking. And then to have it again, as I said, that was how I started to heal because if we, I mean, they're marinating in unconditional love, they're marinating in magic and possibilities. And so when we can connect into that and start to receive that, we can bring more of that into our life. And it was just, it's just amazing. And it's, I find, I don't know if you find this, I find so many synchronicities, you know, through Mm -hmm. Jack, you know, like I found our beautiful friend, Sydney. And then she was like, you have to connect with my friend, Emily. And I'm like, who's Emily? (laughs) It's fascinating how, you know, the synchronicities and how, you you know, the universe just sort of comes in and they're like, Hey, this is where you need to go. And this is what it looks like. I completely agree with all of that. Yes. The Mm -hmm. synchronicity I'm big on signs too. Like Cameron and I almost play this game of like, I'll get this heart somewhere. And I'll be like, okay, yeah, it's just a heart. And then I'll get like another sign right after it. And he's like, no, this really is me. So sometimes there will be like a series of things because I try to connect every sign to like, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What's happening? So I can interpret it. And if I can't make that connection, then I'm sort of like, yeah, it's a heart. Yep. Hi, buddy. It's a heart, whatever. And he's like, no, this is a sign. Take this as a sign. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I love it. There's still a continued relationship. There is still that if you allow it or you sort of open yourself up to it. It's true. And, and, you know, people always say to me, you know, the the number one question I have is, well, I can't experience my child. You know, I just, maybe I I can't do this or, or, you know, it's just, it's not possible for me, but I always tell people it's how open and available you are and where you are with your grief, because grief is just, it's a, it's a lower, a lower emotion. Right. And, you know, not to get too scientific, but I I love the work of of David Hawkins with the, the consciousness scale. Right. And, you know, I always tell people for us to be able to connect with our loved ones on the other side, you know, we need to be up, you know, closer to love. And that's the, that's the vibration at about 500 and shame is at 20 grief is at 70. So I always love to give people that visual to say, you know, this is kind of where you need to be to create a magical life to experience your child on the other side, but your vibration is down here. So we've got a little bit of work to do. And so it just, it's to, to try to give someone's logical mind, something to sort of grab onto. So then we can get into the possibilities. We can get into the non-logical and and we start to. mm -hmm. And I always, I always like, I love that scale because I've shared that scale in my groups too, to talk about like, just we are energetic beings. And I feel like a lot of times when I go there, people think that's a little bit too woo woo. And so I always try to balance that with, well, science has proven that literally everything in the world has a vibration. It has a frequency there. It's made of energy. Right. And so then I can take people into that space and I feel like it's a little less, you know, woo woo. That's the word. I feel like everybody sees everything as, okay, that's a little bit too out there, but it's really not. Right. It's so true. And I love the work of, of Joe Dispenza, right? I mean, Dr. Joe is, is fantastic. Like you were saying, they've, they have scientifically dissected (laughs) the vibrations and, and what that looks like. And I always tell people, you know, if you can imagine, you know, when you walk into a room and you flick the light switch on how quickly that current runs to illuminate the light in the room, that's how quick spirit energy is. And so if we are, I mean, we're dense already in the physical body and then, yeah, if we've got these heavy emotions, it's just, it's kind of like a, kind of like a hot air balloon. Like we've got stuff weighing us down, but if we can find ways to release all of that, then we feel better and we're lighter. And then we're able to make that connection even more. I just, I love that. I just love it. Now tell us about your book, Confessions of Child Loss. Yeah. So I wrote my early grief. That was sort of one of my outlets and I wrote it and I wrote it and I wrote it and I shared it and it resonated with a lot of people. And I, I always sort of knew, I tell people, like I always knew throughout my entire life, I would write a book. 
And I tried several times. I was like, I really don't even know what I would write about until Cameron died. And then I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to write about. Yep. So it, Confessions of Child Loss is really just all of the early, ugly, messy stuff that I went through sprinkled in with that reconnection to Cameron. It's really like I take it through our story um, and I literally have like these 12 things that are sort of like, these are my confessions. They're the ugly things that we don't like to talk about that I believe we need to talk about. Um, and it really, I never intended the book to be a, here's the breaking and the ugly and the messy. And then, you know, here's the healing part of it. I never expected there to be healing in this. Mm. I literally, I wrote the first, however many chapters and I had the book on my computer and it was just sitting there. And I'm like, I don't know how this ends. I don't know how to end it. And it wasn't until I was into like my third and fourth year when I started to do all of the work myself and figure myself out and find that there was some healing in this. And I was like, okay, now I know how to write the end of the book. And so it's literally that evolution of, right, being in that space where we don't heal from this and this is the ugliness, this is what we experience to this is how we reconnect with our kids. These are the ways that we do this again. Absolutely. I love that. Would you share one of the confessions? I have so many confessions in there. Yes. So I go through literally the fact that um, we don't heal from this is one of those confessions to say, like, I really thought that we didn't heal from this. Um, one of my other confessions was the fact that I felt like I killed my son in this, right? And so the grief and the guilt that we carry, I was the one that administered the medication that kicked off the attack that he had that night. He had a rare blood disorder. We didn't know it existed. And so I always come back to that because I had a physical reaction to doing that. And, and I was like, he shouldn't have this. I shouldn't give it, but I couldn't explain why it was just an over-the-counter nasal spray and I used it. Right. So I gave it to him and that was the catalyst that kicked it off. So I spent a lot of time sort of working through that, um, and feeling like if I had just listened to myself, he would still be here. Right. So there's all those sorts of things where it's like, this is something that happens. This is something we think about in grief. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about the fact that communication, like I didn't think that I thought he was gone. He's not gone. He's still here just in a different way. Yeah, exactly. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Now, would you share a little bit about, we, we talked briefly about it the other day and, and you mentioned it earlier about um, building a self-care package. Yes. What does that look like for someone? I think that we are conditioned to think about self-care in such a small, frivolous way, mm -hmm. right? It's going to the spa, it's getting our hair done, it's getting our nails, it's, it's taking a day off, a mental health day. But I feel like when you get into the grief experience, especially, it's way bigger than that. And so we have to come back into our bodies. We have to understand what's going on in our thoughts, what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're doing. We have to understand how to take care of ourselves in those moments when things are really, really bad. Mm -hmm. And I look at self-care as a much bigger thing than what I ever did before. It's literally learning to say no to things, even if they're things that we think we need or that are good for us in the moment but we aren't ready for them right now, or it's not good for us right now. It's understanding, right? When I'm super anxious, like my nervous system is dysregulated and I need to go to this toolkit, right? It's building this toolkit of things that we can practice and do that sort of puts us in a seat of empowerment. I feel like when we live in grief, grief is in the driver's seat. It is driving down the road. It is in 100% full control. And so we have to learn how to pull it out of the driver's seat and put ourselves back in there. And it's really just about understanding ourselves better, learning how to take better care of ourselves and expanding, or I guess, opening ourselves up to what self-care is because it's not selfish. It's literally understanding what we need in every given moment, creating boundaries, creating the environment that we need in order to thrive and do our best. And so it's understanding what all of that is and kind of putting it together. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. I call it the, I, uh, on my end of things, I call it our, our spiritual toolbox. And so I always love to yes. empower people with that spiritual toolbox so that, you know, when, when they're not, when we're not chatting, they can, you know, I'm going to read a book or maybe I'll meditate or maybe I'll do this. Yes. Or, 
you know, what is it that I need? And, and I love what you said, you know, what is it, what is it coming into our body, you know, right. Yeah. That's first and foremost coming into our body and, um, you know, really figuring out what you need on all of those different levels. And, you know, it's, I think it's wonderful work to be able to tell people, you know, these are stages that perhaps people go through. Um, I also love to take it a little bit deeper and tell people you may experience some of those. You may not, you may ping pong between a bunch of them and you may have a bunch of your own stuff thrown in there. So it's just, it's like a montage of everything. And so I love that you empower people with, um, with the self-care package to start to really tune into what is it that I need? You know, I think I think that we're so used to looking outside ourselves for answers. Yes. We're so used to, right? Like I'm going to so book at this person. Yeah. And to look in. For ourselves and what we really need and make everybody yes. else happy. And like, we have to learn. I feel like this whole journey for me is unlearning a lot of those things and relearning <laughs> new ways. It yes. really has been a lot of that. And it's, it's entirely figuring out what we need, how to put ourselves first and mm-hmm. having the tools. Oh, absolutely. It, Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, you just nailed it. Right. And it's, yeah. I find, you know, and, and after, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier about how, you know, losing a child, it, it's the opportunity to, be, to, you know, really be the best version of you. It's really, you know, is, is it, it just, it's like you, you're just shedding so many different layers and so many different stories and the patterns. And, you know, this is who I thought it was and maybe I'm not that. And who, who am I really? And what does this look like? And, um, and it's, it's really quite fascinating when we start to look at it from that perspective, it's just, there's so much, so much that's wrapped up in all of that. And, um, you know, I found it, it got to the point where I really sat there and I thought, okay, what do I know that's true for me? What I know that's true for me is that my heart feels like it's shattered into a million pieces and that I had to find the right people to share it with. I needed to, you know, have, you know, go sit by the river and, you know, not wear a mascara. And so I, I kind of had all of that put together. And then what I found was interesting was after I went through all of that, like when I finally, you know, realized, okay, he's okay, he's safe. And, you know, he used to come in and we play count the freckles. And so he'd be like, how many freckles do I have? And so we would have these little fun games. And, you know, sometimes he would say, close your eyes, open your hand and I open my hand and there'd be a frog in my hand. I'd be like, ah, what are you doing? Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Right. And so he has this jovial, beautiful energy and I see him growing up. And so when he comes through to me, I see a 10 year old. Right. And that isn't, that right. isn't the same for everybody. Right. And what I found was interesting was after I started connecting with Jack and I started finding the heart rocks and, you know, he started coming into my dreams all the time. And, you know, I just really started to feel him. Um, it was interesting because I sat there and I thought, what were the things that I enjoyed before all of this happened? Like, where, where did, where did my joy go? Where did my fun go? And then I made the click that, oh, I can still be with my grief and my heartache, but I can also be, you know, At the same time. Yes. Yes. Like <laughs> just skill that we have to learn is like feeling more than one thing and having the joy come in, but also having that little bit of sadness that's still there that grief that still exists holding space for both yeah yeah absolutely and I always tell people you know we are multifaceted you know we're kind of like a Rubik's cube you know what what day is it we're green this day we're red this day (laughs) there's so many parts to us and it's 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 being inclusive with all of the parts right like there's still days I mean 10 years in there's still days where I'm I'm just, I'm, I'm crushed. It's just something will happen. Something will trigger me. And it's like, okay, there's that soft spot again. It's still there. Right. Like, and that's okay. And just, it's okay. And it's so sweet because the days, I guess, I love how you said that when you find the signs, you know, you know, if there's something happening and then there's the sign. And um, there was one day, I can't remember what happened, but it was just, I was having a really off day and it was just really tender. And, and I kind of sat there and I thought maybe I'll meditate. So I went down by the river and I sat there and I was just quiet. And then I saw this little hand, and I, then this little hand came on my heart and Jack was there and he's like, mama, don't cry. I'm here. I'll help you. And it was just, oh my gosh, just, just, just this sweet little ball of, of magic <laughs> is how I can describe him. And it's just, yeah. And it's, it's, and again, not telling people you have to believe this and you have to believe what I believe. Everyone believes in something. And so whatever yeah. that is, just honor it and, and, and love it and, and allow it to grow. And, um, but I've just found from the spiritual perspective is that I wouldn't have been able to do this if I hadn't connected with him again. 
I always, yes, all the people who believe there's nothing after this, like that breaks my heart because I'm like, oh my God, I don't know how that I would ever have survived yes. if I hadn't reconnected with him in this way. It's true. It's so true. Like I just, my life, as painful as it was, my life began the day that I reconnected with him and it was like, oh, you are. And, and same thing. I blame myself, you know, I should yeah. have listened to this doctor and I should have done this and I did it. And, you know, uh, we had started the in vitro process. No, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have waited and I should have done this. And so I went through that whole thing of just, you know, totally throwing myself under the bus. And it was just like, no. And, and it gave me, it gave me just a sense of calm. There was a, um, there was a coach that I worked with years ago and he said, what if you made, what if you made the safest choice at the time? What if the choices that you made at the time were the safest or, or that was the best that, that you could do at that time? What if, yeah. what if, it, what if we could, we could reframe it and we can change it and, and not beat ourselves up and not sit in the misery with it because it's just, oh my goodness. And, you know, there were, again, there were so many different groups that I'd reached out to and, and sort of sort of did some homework on, and it was almost like misery loves company. It was like, yes. I attended a few of their, their meetings and it was like, everyone would share their heartbreak, but then there wasn't anything lifting it. There wasn't anything positive. There wasn't anything, there wasn't anything, there wasn't the duality. And so I love any hope. Yeah. I feel like we're yes. so void of hope in that, in that space. Yes. And it's almost like, it's almost like people give up, you know, I, I remember, um, after a, a cousin of mine had, had passed away, I remember my aunt saying, you're not supposed to bury your children. You were not supposed to bury your children. And she was never the same after that. It was yeah. just, and, and again, it's, and again, not to negate the loss or what happened around that, but it was just, we are the creators of our life. And so losing a child is one aspect of our life. It isn't our entire life. Yeah. And again, it's not something that we, you know, wake up one day and think, Hey, you know, this, I'd like to experience this. No, that's not, that isn't right. how it works. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, we, we learn to invite it in and we learn to, yeah. you know, just tell people, what if we were to get curious about it? Where are we feeling that in our body? What am I thinking right now? You know, yeah. what is it that I need right now? And just really tapping into that. And so do you find, um, I find a lot of people want to uh, make it intellectual. It's like, these, these are the yes. stages. And this is what you're going through. And then they completely forget the body and our spirit. Yes. <laughs> yes. 100%. I believe there is a mind, body, soul connection. Like you have to be working on all three fronts yeah. to figure this out. And <clears throat> it's so easy to intellectualize it because we want to read a book. We want to hear how somebody else did. It, and then we want to just be like, okay, so I just need to do this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but so much of it is the feeling and we just are, it's so hard to sit with it. I know you talked about earlier, like learning how to sit with it. I remember feeling like if I start crying, I'm never going to stop. And so that was a scary place to be, it would be out of control. And I did not like to be out of control. Yeah. And I think learning how to be in that space and knowing that that is temporary. You're going to go through that and release that and move through that in a way that is not, you're not going to get stuck there. You're not going to stay there forever. Mm -hmm. I think that's important learning in this as we learn to sit with it and learn to do it. But yeah, that reconnecting our brain and what we're thinking about to our hearts and what we're feeling, that's a big part of this. Oh, it's huge. And, you know, I always tell people, you know, if you, as crazy as it sounds, if you can acknowledge whatever it is, mm -hmm. oftentimes that energetic charge will start to dissipate because there's yes. just that grief just wants to be heard. It wants it, to be that, noticed. Yes. It wants to be noticed and wants to be acknowledged. And once we can say, yeah. okay, I see you. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I don't want you here. <laughs> I yes. hate you. I don't want you here. Okay. You're here. <laughs> what do we do with this? And then, right. You know, I always tell people just, you have to be very gentle with yourself. You need to give yourself yeah. grace. I mean, if, if your favorite person on the world was going through a uh, favorite person in the world was going through what you're going through, how would you treat them? Yeah. Right. Like we need That's to just really, really take care of ourselves. And, and there are a lot of people that I had in my world early on after I lost Jack, who were again, I'll just get over it. Well, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. Da, 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 da. And it was like in their mind, it was done. It was yeah. done. And then I gave myself permission to be yes. with it and let it be whatever the heck it needed yes. to be. And it was like, no, he this is a loss. I had had, it was fascinating. I had this reading once. Um, 
and yeah, readers go to other readers, right? Like <laughs> we yeah, have yeah. you can't read stuff. your own people, right? right? I can't get my own stuff. I'm gonna go get somebody else to help me. So I I had an Akashic Records reading. And so the Akashic Records are like a um they're like a um the history of our the soul. Of your, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And so I had this reading and I hadn't said anything about myself. And he said, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. And I, I just kind of looked at him and he said, yeah, he said, this loss is etched in your heart forever. And he said, oh, okay, we need to sit with that. And that was the first thing that came out of his mouth. And I thought I was having a really good day that day. Right. And it's just like energetically that he could pick up on that. I thought, whoa. And that has always stuck with me because he said, that is, the, it's a part of who you are. It's not something that yeah. you just get over. And yeah. especially for, for mothers who, whose child didn't come into the physical, um, I love to give, you know, I love to hold sacred space for, for them, for us, because, yeah. you know, six months before we'd even started the in vitro process, Jack was in my dreams, you know, Emma had her big sister t-shirt on and she had a list of books that she was going to read to him. And she was like, when is my brother going to be in your tummy? And why isn't he here? And she talked to him more than I did. And he was already part of our life. You know, my husband at the time, he named him. He's like, yeah, yeah, we'll name. He's like, are you sure it's a boy? I said, oh, it is a boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, yeah, yeah. He's here. He's here. And he would run around the house and it was crazy. And I remember we named him. It was like, he was, he was real. He was that yeah. real. And then to go from that real, even energetically. Yes. And then he was gone. It was like, Oh God, what do I do with this? Like that was, you know, again, it's like your whole world is just shattered in whatever way that looks for you. Right. Because it's so yeah. different for everyone. And I always love to give women permission. You know, like the one woman said to me, my husband just doesn't want to hear about it anymore. He doesn't want me to talk about it. You know, we have other children. I need to focus on them. Just, you know, you just need to let it go. You know, you keep talking about it. You keep bringing it up again. And I said to her, I said, we have to talk about it. Yeah. We have to talk about it. That's how we honor that child. That's how we honor our experience. And I said, we will talk about it till the cows come home. We will talk about it for the rest of this incarnation. I said, and that's okay. I said, yeah. if other people don't get that, then maybe that's not the conversation that yeah. you have. With yeah. Them. Yeah. I like the word both. I use the word both a lot. And so you can have both things at the same time and they can be two very competing things. Right. And it's just learning to be okay with that. So I'm going to talk about the loss and at the same time, can focus on life. It can sort of be both at the same time. It really is right. Like it's, and it's, I love what you said earlier. I mean, we just, that, that grief is always there. I just, yeah. that is, yeah. Like I'm, I'm different and I'm, I'm, I'm a different person than, you know, I always tell people, you know, like I'm, I'm not the Sean I was before I lost yeah. you. This is, this is a totally never totally will be. Yeah. We no. don't just go back to being who we were. We don't just go back and fit into that life again. No, you can't. You can't. And now uh, I, I found this really fascinating. I was, I was, as I was uh, looking through, you know, trying to figure out what we we're going to talk about today. I mean, we could talk for hours and hours, I'm sure right. days and days and days. <laughs> but there was something that you mentioned that I, I found really interesting. If, if you'd love to share a little bit about it was how to protect our energy when grief is exhausting. Yes. I, going back to what we talked about and just the fact that we are energetic beings, every single time that we interact with a thing, a person, a place, there's like an exchange of energy. And we spend so much time in grief, feeling exhausted, feeling an inner state of turmoil where we go out and we do the things that we might not be ready for. We are with people that might not be the right people. We are trying to show up in a way that isn't authentic. And I look at protecting energy as like figuring, it's again, figuring out what we need, who are the right people, who are, what are the right places, what's the right timing and it's boundaries, right? It's creating these boundaries that what do I allow in my life? What am I going to tolerate now? What are the things that make sense to let in? Because these things that I'm interacting with, they're either going to fuel me with energy or they're going to take it away. And so we have to learn that. And, and it's by feeling too, again, it's that coming back to our body. We are so conditioned to ignore everything that's going on in our body. It's why we don't understand our emotions. It's why we don't understand what's going on with us physically. And grief is such a physical experience. And so we have to learn that we have to figure that out. We have to come back into our bodies and then we have to figure out what are those boundaries? How do we put ourselves first? How do we you know, decide what we tolerate and who we spend time with and when we say yes versus when we say no. I love that. Um, 
I love the parallels in our lives. I, I think they're just, they're just fantastic. Right? <laughs> I, just, I love it. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you, you said who, you know, who, who, and what is fueling my life. And I started yeah. saying about six months ago, I, I really started to, um, I started to shift, you know, I, I just, I had, I had some major life changes and, and I really started to, to think in terms of, does this add value to my life? Is this adding value to my life? Am I adding value to your life? Are you adding value to my life? And something I read, I I, I geek out about this stuff. There was something I read um, in this blog post, this woman, she said, you know, you need to start looking at the distractions, you know, are, are these things adding value to your life? Like I, I very rarely watch TV and I don't listen to the news. And just from the energetic perspective, you know, if there's, I figure if there's something important, uh, I'll hear it from my friends or it'll be on Facebook or right. it'll, it'll come in some other it'll way, get, right? Yeah, it'll get there. Yeah. And so I found that I was really, really protective after everything that I've been through. I'm yeah. really protective of rebuilding my life, yes. of putting the pieces back together. And yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because yeah, it's boundaries. It's like, I don't think I had really strong boundaries before everything that happened with Jack. And I, I yeah. realize now, you know, that I, I get to choose and yes. um, I need to have those, those boundaries. And in this, this blog post, she said something about, um, you know, for example, if your phone lights up and there's a text message and you go, Oh God. <laughs> and I started to notice that happening through email, through text messages, someone would message me and I'd be like, Oh, now what? I just, and yeah. I sat there and I thought, okay, that's not honoring them. Yeah. That's something that's not honoring me. And so yeah. a lot of relationships, I just, you know, just, you just have to bless and release them. And I think yeah. Yeah. And I think it's from going through everything that I've experienced with Jack has given me the chance to really, really evaluate how I show up in the world because it's, right. we're not here forever, right? It's, it's, yeah. what am I here to do? What would I like to contribute to what I, you know, is there a legacy I want to create in honor of Jack? Like, what is it that, who can I help? Like, who are the people that I'm here to help? And so it's interesting because yeah, it all kind of stems back to you know, it's not a group that we've, we, we've, you know, willingly chose to do. I suppose if we looked at it from a soul perspective, if we went down that route, it would be, oh yes, this is, <laughs> this is how it was all supposed to happen. But right. we will just leave that for another day. But yeah, it's just, it's kind of like, that's, that's really interesting. And it's, you know, it's, it's really becoming cognizant and aware of what is it that fuels my life? Like, and I, I say to people, what lights you up? Let's find things that light you up. You know, like I said, yes. I sat there that day and I thought, what used to light me up before this happened? And I was able to go back and gather some of those things and and really start to, and I I talk to my angels and my guides all the time. So I always say, angels, fill my life with so much fun this week. Angels, I need more ground crew, please. Let's do this. Angels, yeah. what am I missing about this? Angels. And so, you know, from the spiritual perspective, I can say to people, you know, just invite those energies into your life and, and right. they will they will help you. Yeah, I do a similar. So I look at it. One of the things that jumped out at me is when I would be in a room full of bereaved parents and I'd be like, what do you want? Right. When you think about like, for me, it was hard to go back and be like, what was my in my life before? Because that didn't fit now. And so I'd be like, well, what do I want my life to look like? And I can't really come up with that. Yeah. And so I go to a feeling word and everybody comes up with peace. Everybody wants to feel peace yes. after this. And so I'm like, so you sort of have to back into this. And I always tell people like, what are the words that you want to feel? How do you want this to feel? And then you back into how do you make it feel that way? And that's the work. So like you said, getting a text message from somebody and like your body tenses up and you're like, oh my gosh, that to me is my sign that I have healing in that things that I have to do yes. to create those boundaries, to release that relationship, to work through whatever is going yes. on for me. And then it makes it easier for me to show up. And so I have these uh, three words that I use that are sort of my guideposts as I go forward. And I'm like, it, I want my life to feel authentic. I want my life to feel balanced. balanced. And I want it to be all about love. You don't love. Oh, I and love so that. I'm like, if something, someone, whatever mm -hmm. doesn't help me achieve those things, then no, like that's not what I want. That's not what I'm going to do. And that's how I try to sort of create that. Obviously it's not perfect, right? There's times you have to say yes to things that don't fit that. But when we talk about kind of rebuilding a life and how to do this, I feel like that gave me a way to, I don't know, highlight a path forward, identify some of my own work that I need to do. And it helps me to get to what everybody wants, that peace, to have that space where you can feel 
okay, good. I love that. That is beautiful. And it was interesting because, you know, when we talked about boundaries, it was the text messages that I would get from people when I would kind of go, I kind of cringe. They were relationships that I previously released. I blessed and released and for whatever reason allowed them to come back in again. And as you've probably experienced, I mean, you have, you have a healing energy, you have a healing frequency. And so a lot of people are drawn to you just for that. And, and that's something that I've had to navigate over the years, right? Like I've been invited to hundreds of lunches and events. And then at some point it's, can I ask you just one question? No, (laughs) back off. Right. And it just, and again, it's boundaries. You're right. Because I had to look at that. It was like, okay, why am I cringing? Like when this person, when I get a message from them, why am I cringing? What is that? And I would get curious and it was just like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to express a boundary and just, you know, sort of figure that out. You know, like I've got, um, you know, I've got several people in my life that, you know, aren't working right now. And so on my client days, I'd hear my phone ping, 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 ping. And I was just like, and then of course I'm like, Ooh, what's in the- yeah. Check like, I don't need to do corporate taxes. I'm going to check my <laughs> phone. No, we, we need to do corporate taxes. Right. And so it was interesting and just little boundaries with, you know, telling people, you know, you know, on the days that I'm seeing clients, you probably won't hear from me because I, yeah. my phone is downstairs and it's just, and having those boundaries, I think my boundaries were just so wishy-washy before everything happened with Jack. And then yeah. after that, it's just become, not that I'm, you know, not that I'm a hard ass now, but it's more, does that work for me? Does that, how does that make me feel? And I love how yeah. you, you keep referencing the body because I think that we're so used to just ignoring it, shutting it off, yeah. whatever it's no, it's, it's logical. I'm going to think my way through this and, you know, working through grief. I mean, that's whenever I'm grieving, my entire body aches. Yeah. My entire body feels like it's crying and I yeah. cry and I cry. And then I think I can't cry anymore. And I will cry more and more and more. And then I need to sleep. And it's just, it's, it's really fascinating. I didn't understand what it was at first, those first few years after losing Jack, I felt like the flu for three years. I was like, my body ached and it was sore and my heart just felt like it, it was just, just so sore. It was like, Oh, right. And then again, having that compassion for myself and going, Oh, what does my body need? What does she need? You know, I used to, I used to kickbox like that's what got me through my divorce I joke with people but I'm like kickboxing got me through my divorce. I'm sure that was helpful yeah it's I tell people all the time, go get a punching bag yes it's yes. wonderful and in this I haven't been kickboxing for about a year now and it's like huh, I don't my body doesn't want to do that anymore my body doesn't want to I mean I, I find other ways to you know work out and and yeah. I'm a gym rat but yeah it's, it's interesting right and I, I love I love I love what you said I mean grief is there are all those different layers to it. It's not just here's your list, right? Here's your checklist. Yeah. When you're done that, you're done. And we move yeah. on. I and we move on and we're good. Yeah. And we move on. Right. And it's, it's not something that we can compartmentalize. It's not right. something that we can just be like, oh, okay. Right. Instead, it's like, I see this big chest of drawers and it's like, okay, well, grief is out. Like <laughs> you yeah. can't put it in there and it stays. That in drawer there. doesn't close. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's always open it's like oh where is he he's out he's oh no he's not in his drawer oh no do I wear mascara today right like it's just it's a completely different way of life yeah yeah I love it I loved our conversation today thank you so much just just a world of a world of information and you're just such a beautiful resource for for parents who have lost children so we have we will have all the information about your book, about your, uh, your groups and, um, how people can get in touch with you, uh, with the grief coaching and your program and all of, all of you, all of your, your amazing gifts that you're sharing the world. So again, thank you so much for, um, for taking the time and for, for sharing your heart and and sharing your beautiful Cameron with us and just so grateful. And no, me too. I so appreciate all this time. I loved our conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you.